everyone all good in the hood? Wonderful. Well, welcome to our NPN audience and conference goers out there. I'm Crystal C. Mercer, the moderator of your panel today on staging equity, performers for placemaking in creative communities. I have with me Gary Anderson of Plowshares Theater and Marcellus Harper of Collage Dance Collective. And our flow is going to be simple today. We're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to dig a little deeper into this topic on how we see the intersection of artistic communities and equity in our various fields and our mediums. And then we'll give some final thoughts. And as we go along, feel free to put your thoughts and questions into the chat and we will do our best to answer as many of those as we can in the digital space. And since I'm starting this party, I'll keep it going with my introduction. Again, Crystal C. Mercer, affectionately known as CC. I am the program manager at Artspace Consulting. I'm also, in addition to that work, a celebrated poet, published author, fiber artist, and I run a small nonprofit called A Black Space, where our mission is to celebrate and liberate and serve Black folks through culture bearing, oral tradition, and ancestral craft. It was with my work through Artspace that I got to meet these amazing panelists that you're going to get to learn more about today through the Immersion Program, which is a cohort-based program to help nonprofits navigate their own space-related challenges and turning those big ideas into achievable plans. And these are two men who definitely make things happen. So I want to give the floor next to Gary Anderson with Plowshares Theater to introduce himself. Hi, my name is Gary Anderson. I'm producing artistic director for Plowshares Theater Company. We are situated in Detroit, Michigan. We are actually Michigan's only professional equity theater company. We've been in existence since 1989, and we are just recently um, beginning to look at creating our own artistic home, our own facility here. Um, within the next couple of years. Thank you, Gary, so much for that context and shout out to Detroit. <laughs> and next we will pass it over to Marcellus Harper with Collage Dance. Thank you, Cece. Uh, my name is Marcellus Harper. I am the um, executive director of Collage Dance Collective. Um, before I talk to you a little bit about collage, um, I just want to share that I um, uh, just want to, my voice is not at full strength. Um, I recently had surgery, so I'm still on um, my road to recovery. So I just ask that you grant me some grace um, during this panel. Um, but as I said, I'm the executive director of Collage Dance Collective. We are a professional ballet company and conservatory based in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we have two core programs. Um, one is our professional company. And so we have artists from all over the world, all over the, yeah, all over the world. Uh, who now call Memphis home, um, and we tour nationally and um, regionally and perform locally. We also have a conservatory where we train about 800 kids a week in classical ballet, jazz, tap, and West African. Um, yeah, so very excited to to be here and, and honored that CC invited me to be part of the panel. Thank you, Marcellus, for your introduction. You know, we are all sending you healing vibes on this journey. You have infinite grace, so do not worry Thank about you. that. Your voice sounds good. Shout out to Memphis, which is right up the street from where I am in Little Rock, Arkansas. So we have quite the diverse perspective from all over the country as we converge into this Zoom space. And I would like to just jump right in to the questions and the work that we do. And you mentioned dance, of course, Gary, with theater. my background is in theater arts and dance. Uh, I'm not on the ballet level, Marcellus, uh, but also a published poet. And so taking these concepts of performance art, such as the mediums that we use, how do you feel those artistic mediums uh, generate placemaking for our various communities? And Gary, I'll start with you. Hey. So I think it's critically important for us as storytellers to really immerse ourselves in the communities in which we reside, specifically as, uh, as Black storytellers, um, because in many cases, it's our stories that have been erased 
or removed from the canon of what this country has created and been. And so in many cases, we're doing the task of revitalizing actually and investigating and researching and bringing those stories back out so that they can be experienced by the next generation. Um, so I think place as well as product as well as purpose are all interconnected. So that means that you, most recently we just did a play, a musical that we developed for two years um, called Hastings Street, which is really talking about the, the raising, the, dis, the destruction of a section of Detroit called Black Bottom, um, Paradise Valley. They were the black, segregated Black community in Detroit before the latter part of the 20th century. And when the interstate was brought through this area, it was designated that that would be where the interstate would come through. So we tore up this thriving Black neighborhood that had the full array of citizens from lower income to upper income residing in this area, again, because it was segregated. We had a thriving cultural and entertainment district that was all destroyed so you could put in concrete in the highway so white folks would go in and out of from Detroit to the suburbs quicker. Mm. Um, we did this play about those circumstances, about that neighborhood and about the challenges the residents in that community suffered under to really tell that story. It was the first time in almost 60 years where that part of Detroit's history was being recognized. And to know about what Detroit is today, you can't, you, you, you have to know that story because everything that has proceeded since 1949 to today has been predicated on the impact of that decision by city fathers to dismantle a community, to, to destroy generational wealth, um, and to basically put a scar in the city that was this highway that destroyed a neighborhood. People who had grown up next to one another were no longer there and, and how those people dispersed, some into other parts of the city, some into neighboring suburbs, some just left the state. Mm. You brought up some really interesting points there, Gary, and the three things that stood out to me were those, those three Ps, so it's place, product and purpose on how you're being intentional of telling that story. And so many of us from the South to the North, to the East, to the West <laughs> have experienced uh, the destruction of neighborhoods through the interstate project. Our black business district in Little Rock was a historic West 9th street, which was obliterated by the interstate. So definitely can uh, empathize with that parallel and your work, the, no the amount of years you put in to produce said work to tell this story about the research and the place making. And yeah, Marcel COVID helped. Co COVID helped a little bit. Well, COVID, <laughs> I stitched a book in COVID. So yes, COVID definitely <laughs> gave us some time to whoo, just recalibrate. And it's like, what do we want to focus on? And the importance also that you mentioned, Gary, about uh, our role as Black storytellers in preserving that history. And we know that there is a lot of history in Memphis, Tennessee, <laughs> Marcellus, and wondering what your thoughts are about how your work in ballet and with the conservatory contributes to placemaking in Memphis. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, I agree um, with everything that Gary said, particularly about the importance of um, you know, being able to tell these stories. Um, you know, it's it's how the legacy continues. Um, I think also one of the um, disastrous impacts of racism is its uh, its ability to dampen our ability to to imagine and our imaginations. And um, and so I think one of the beautiful things about art is that we're able to, and artists and creatives, is that you're able to imagine the world that we deserve, imagine a world that doesn't exist. Um, 
imagine ways forward. And so I think um, both of those things, I think, are very important that the medium allows us to maintain the legacy and tell the stories. And also that as artists and creatives, we can also imagine the world that we deserve and the world that we want and, and then move towards that. Um, so we it's really the, the visionary aspect that excites me. I like that uh, imagination is such a driver because it, it it are these thought these thoughts we have that are fueling us forward and those seeds that are planted how they begin to blossom and maturate in our community. So I like that imagery, Marcellus, of just imagining what we deserve, what we envision, uh, you know, from the space around us, how we can transform that through our imaginations. So so thank you for your thoughts on that. And, and moving this forward, because Gary, you talked about Plowshares is getting gearing up to have a permanent home and building that space. And Marcellus Collage Dance Collective in the recent years has been able to establish a home base for your company. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the setbacks or even some of the triumphs of your space-related project? Because you're doing the work and you're imagining what it can be, but what have been some of uh, those, those points <laughs> on the journey that you can share with our NPN audience that's got you where you are today in that, in that place-making process? Who you want to go first? You, Gary. <laughs> okay, all right. I just want, I didn't want to assume. Um, so pretty much since the sixth season of the of Plowshares when it started, I have been thinking about having an, uh, my, our own space. And a lot of that was, to be quite frank, because we had aspirations, big dynamic ideas. And we thought that the best way to do that was would be to establish ourselves in a permanent location. So, but God had other plans. <laughs> and what we found is that we found a great deal of resistance to that idea. Um, funders were not interested in us having our own space in a large part because they thought that it would be better for us to partner with a larger organization and, and work out and negotiate some kind of rental agreement to use their spaces, which we did, which always were designed to disenfranchise us, which did. Um, I have told people, and this joke's gotten old, I've moved more often than the Jews in the Old Testament um, because we've been all over the city of Detroit in various spaces, sometimes more than once because we were constantly doing that at the, at the disadvantage, I think, of building ourselves a core audience that, was, that could rely on knowing exactly where we were. And, but the beauty of living long enough is that you, you actually learn some things that you may not have known at that point that kind of solidified, which I think have actually panned out over the last four or five years. We wanted to start off doing this as, some, you know, an establishment of our importance in society, facility constituted stability and establishment. And I think now, now the focus is on part of my board and myself is that we're really here as a servant to the community and that we need to have a place where our mission can be enshrined and do and, and have the greatest impact, not necessarily for our own bravado or for our own sense of what professionalism is, but instead really to try to be a catalyst for economic and community development where we reside. As I told you, the that segregated black black bottom had been raised, right? Well, we and we had our own indigenous significant arts, uh, cultural, and entertainment district, places where people like 
uh, Della Reese started, um, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, um, Bill, Billy Eckstein, all these, uh, Sarah Vaughn, all these great artists played there. When they came to Detroit, this is where they went. You know, they may play at Orchestra Hall or they may be at some, but when they, when they came to perform, this is where they were. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity for us to build a new Hastings Street in Detroit. I think there's an opportunity for us to create an area that is a new art and cultural destination site for the city that is black operated, that's black led, that is black centered. And that's what we see ourselves doing now. We're, we looked at an area where we think we could have the greatest impact, a catalyst for economic development, one where we could serve the surrounding neighborhoods with programming that not only uh, benefits our organization, but also helps elevate the community in a greater awareness of who and what they are, what they're capable of being, and also find ways of attracting other business opportunities to that area that can provide jobs and economic development and a, a, a increased level of, of quality of life by being an uh, anchor for that. And all of this came over the last 30 years. It's not something I thought of in that fifth or sixth season of the company, but that is something where I see it's really important um, for us to have a program that is designed around those ideals as opposed to serving some desire for professionalism on our part. Yeah, it's it's almost like you're creating this uh, ecosystem where you're talking exactly. about the storytelling, the professional growth, uh, also the financial stability, but the stability of where you are, the audience, people know where to find you, people can trust that you're there, people can right. be part of it. So that's super exciting that like this, this vision that has been imagined over these last decades is starting to to, to manifest in different ways. And it parallels a lot with what I've heard you talk about, Marcellus, when you were in, in progress with the space that you call home now for Collage Dance Collective. And I'm wondering if you can speak to those same things in terms of your organization. In terms of the, the, the triumphs and the setbacks. Yes, because we know yes. <laughs> there were well, three. Let okay. me, let me... Let me start with the positive and, and focus on that. So a few years ago, um, we launched a capital campaign uh, to build a brand new center for dance. Um, it was a comprehensive campaign. Our goal was to raise it 11 million. Um, 9 million was going to be to build the new center. And then we um, were gonna raise some funds for operating and also um, for a board controlled reserve. Um, before the pandemic, we already knew that having a reserve is important and we didn't have one. Um, so that's what we set out to do. I think what really fueled that, um, you know, our drive to see this campaign through in the middle of a global pandemic was all the stuff we were talking about in the first question. Um, you know, we were not the first Black dance makers to land in Memphis and make ballet accessible to Black and Brown youth. There were dozens of pioneers who've come before us, many of whom um, were never on the mainstream radar, and many of whom were working in times when Blacks were not allowed to participate in ballet. And they did this work in their basements and churches and in makeshift studios. And unfortunately, when they transition, their work and their legacy often fade from the mainstream record. So cultural institutions and facilities are important. As Gary said, they tell and they maintain the stories of a people. And so there's so many predominantly white cultural institutions, you know, our opera houses, um, our museums, our symphonies, that get this, you know, and that are ferociously supported because there's some communities get this. And so we need black culture institutions too, especially in a city like Memphis where people of color make up nearly 70%. And so I think it was 
the pioneers who've come before, the understanding that, you know, we did not want our work to fade. We wanted this work to be able to be built upon. And we wanted, we wanted to leave something for generations after us. And so that really fueled us pushing and, you know, getting um, our community to buy into this vision, getting our community to understand. Um, and so we were able to successfully raise the money in the middle of the campaign, I think, because we were able to articulate that vision um, with clarity and um, we were able to get it done. Um, and so for me, that's the triumph, the fact that we got it done and the fact now that the legacy of the dancers who are in that space will be protected and that generations who come after will have will be in a position of strength because they're building upon that. Um, the setbacks, um, and you know, there were many. I think anyone who works, who tries to get a construction project done um, can talk about setbacks all day. The pandemic was a major setback. I think it really changed how we gather you know, as, as communities. And so it was frustrating is probably one of the mildest words I can use, trying to figure out how to build a space that was supposed to bring people together, that was supposed to be a center for togetherness and activation and community and how the world has shifted and changed and how we shift and change um, to meet the world where it is. Um, but all that said, we got it done. So, you know, as I said, I like to focus on, on the triumphs. Hello. <laughs> but very good points you made that it's, it's, it's not all roses and daffodils. There will be some setbacks. The pandemic pivot that I think we all took, uh, whether you were getting your art done or recalibrating for projects that were manifesting and of course came to be for you, uh, is time that hopefully, uh, or most definitely was well spent, especially when you talk about the dancers that come through there now, their legacy is preserved, it's intact. And that is a beautiful thing for the city of Memphis and everybody who is watching the work that you do. So thank you for that, Marcellus. I want to uh, kind of, bring it back to this idea of gathering, you saying that, and Gary, you've mentioned that as well, like a place where community could come and be and know that they are welcomed and invited. And I wanna ask for, for each of you, and maybe we'll switch it up. We'll start with you this time, Marcellus, and then kick it to you, Gary, uh, about space being it physical or emotional, inform how we think about building equitable communities. Right, and I think um, in part of my last response, I probably you know, answered that question or um, again, I go back to you know, just how cultural institutions are important because they tell the stories of a people. And I think, um, you know, it's important that we have more black cultural institutions, facilities um, that are gonna help tell our stories and maintain our stories um, that we don't have enough and that so much of our, our culture, particularly when it comes to um, the arts is not, has not been recorded in the mainstream record. And you know we can obviously debate whether that matters or not, but um, we see it all the time, you know, in classical ballet, when um, there are, there's been considerable contributions by African Americans, by Black people, in the ballet space, um, and so often when mainstream publications or mainstream media. Um, or the industry itself speaks about our contributions, it doesn't account for that rich history. 
you know, oftentimes it starts with more contemporary players um, who have done considerable, remarkable work, but who have not done this work, you know, in isolation, who have not done this work um, absent from pioneers who've come before them. And so I think what institutions do is they help to keep the record straight. They help to keep the history honest. And so um, for me, that's very emotional. And it's, um, it's something that I hope that the space that we've created in Memphis as a young organization will inspire um, other dance makers across the country to push and to know that it's possible so that again, our legacy and our history um, can be protected. Ashe, let's set the record straight and let's keep the record straight. Okay, Marcellus, you know I'm joining your church, the Church of Marcellus. Everybody out there in the NPN audience, feel free to go and make a donation. <laughs> what a word, yes. And Gary, I know that same rich history that lives in Detroit. Even when you said pioneers, Marcellus, I would be remiss not to mention my late father, attorney Christopher C. Mercer, who was a part of a group that was coined the six pioneers. They were the first African-American students to desegregate the law school at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. They were only accepting black students on the graduate level. So when you talk about all of these people who came before my youngest brother, who's an attorney, it didn't fall out of the sky. It's like he had the example of my father. He had the example of Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall, who was friends with my father and all of these people who, uh, blazed the path, put the bricks down, busted the doors open and said, walk on through. So I'm, I'm very appreciative that you've mentioned that in the world of dance as well. It's like there are shoulders upon shoulders upon shoulders that elevate these people that we see today, also giving them their flowers for the work that they've done. And we know that similar work has been done in Detroit, Gary. I mean, it's Motown, baby. So <laughs> outside of that, all of the rich history of Detroit, not just on the music scene, but as you mentioned in this Black business district and what you're doing with Plowshares. I'm wondering if you can speak to that as well, this, this physical space and emotional space, how that helps build more equitable communities and maybe from the lens of Detroit. So I'm a re recovering teacher. So you have to, I'll have to apologize. I have a tendency to um, set terms for, the definitions for terms. So people, not because I don't think you know what they mean, but in many cases, because I want you to understand where I'm coming from. So when we talk about equity or equitable, um, I need to help people understand that equity is not equal. Equity is justice. Embedded in equity is the mission to repair for past harms and mistakes that impacted a community. I say. Okay, so um, when we look at when we look at equity, we have to look at not just giving people the same level that they are that that other groups have. So, for example, in New Orleans, um, early on they had an opera house, and then they had a Creole opera house for the Creole community or they had a symphony and they had a Creole symphony. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about in regards to equity is making up for all the things that have been taken away and denied and have been impaired in regards to opportunities generations prior. Um, we That's what I'm looking at. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand that these are difficult conversations and not shy away from them when we have we have people who need who, that we need to approach about creating these spaces in large part because as what Marcellus is saying we're trying to create them as safe spaces where these conversations can occur mm -hmm. which means that we need to make sure that they, we are able to be our full authentic selves in these spaces we don't have to worry about curbing what we say or how we say it because it may impact 
negatively on a partition, a portion of the audience. We need to be free to say these things, to, to articulate these emotions and present these ideas so that we don't worry about folks getting all up in arms and spending a year and a half passing legislation against critical race theory in pre-K through 12 schools when we know it is not taught there, mm. right? Um, so we need. So that's why we need to do this. We have need to have these spaces because we, when those circumstances occur, it's arts and cultural organizations they have to stand in the gap because that those points of view, that perspective on history, those ideas, those emotional responses have to be able to be aired in an environment where they won't be challenged simply because they contradict the status quo. Marcellus was talking about how the symphony and the or opera and the orchestras in our communities create a narrative about culture. And they also create a narrative about the supremacy of which culture is above others. We live in a country where to this day, many black artists walk out of theater programs with a degree or two thinking that William Shakespeare is the world's greatest playwright, which is ridiculous. Not, I'm not saying the work isn't good, yeah. but it's ridiculous to assume somebody more than 600 years ago was able to create the greatest work and that, they, that there's been no one since then that has begun to examine the human condition from different points of view. If you just look at it from our perspective, there are three people of color in his work. One is a guy who's, who's, whose jealousy is manipulated against him to destroy the happiness he would have had with a woman who loved him dearly. And next one is a prop a guy who comes to petition marriage for one of the characters um, and is turned down because of the color of his skin. And the third one is this straight out villain who just does all this evil to destroy all these white people and eventually ends up getting it, getting it in the end for all his actions. That's the extent of Shakespeare's ex examination of people of, of dark skin or African ancestry, Middle East, nothing else. So how can you be the world's greatest playwright if your thoughts have not been expanded to take in the perspectives of others? And so that's why we talk about when we talk about these spaces of being equitable, we need to understand that what, if there is a charge on our tape, our plate, there's a responsibility that we have to open up the conversation and, and talk about things, talk about subjects and circumstances that are prevalent even to the day that may offend others because they contradict the current narrative that we accept as the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's why these spaces have to be, and again, I wanna be real clear, equity is not equal. Equity is justice. Thank you, Gary, for that estimation. Uh, I was talking about Shakespeare yesterday, took a special topics class called the Lear Project. <clears throat> Familiar with all the, <laughs> from Othello on, who are you talking about? Yes, but it should definitely include others. And I guess rhetorical question for my own self, the NPN audience or whoever is out there listening. Um, why does my healing offend you? And to right. the point, Gary, to just have the space, not talk, right. not react, not right. bomb, not offend, not commit violence against, like right. express this deep, traumatic, collective ancestral pain that I want to rid myself of. Right. So uh, very, very beautiful point. And, and speaking of having these uncomfortable conversations to our NPN audience, just encouraging you to continue to put your thoughts and your questions in the chat and wanting to move forward with uh, you all. And maybe starting with you, Gary, because having conversation with you, learned so much about Detroit, the work that you do, and how this story is not isolated to Little Rock. It's not isolated to Memphis, this right up the street, where it's spanned across this country that we live in. And wondering if you can speak to 
um, how does gentrification affect generational wealth for our and you know indigenous local people to the area and also especially our communities of color well that's an interesting topic because that's actually been um one of the things that we've been talk talking about here in detroit um, currently we're going through another period of economic development where there is now a growing level of investment in the community and in many cases it's being led or spearheaded by people who did not look like folks who lived in the city or their parents or grandparents may have lived here, but they were raised outside of the community and now they're investing in the city because the land is cheap, the buildings are cheap, and they see an opportunity to develop businesses that will make, they'll become quite lucrative without really taking into consideration the community that resides here. Um, Detroit went through an interesting phase for several decades. We, after the, the 68 Ro rebellion, um, for a number of years, we ended up having um, a real growth in people believing that they need to take, Black folks need to take reign, take control of the reins in, in the city. And in 73, we elected our first Black mayor. Um, who assisted in building a, a Black political class that could continue to create those kind of ongoing opportunities. A few years ago now, we, we've gone through some changes. <clears throat> we've had other representatives of that community or people who came out of that process lead. And now we have, once again, a white mayor who has expressed interest in Develop, continuing to develop and support the community. Um, but we, we have seen evidence to the contrary in a lot of areas. Um, we also have recently gone through the mid, midterm elections where a 70 year track record of at least black representation in, in the US House of Representatives has been ended and that the two representatives that are sitting there seated, who finally got a chance to take the swear, be sworn in last Saturday night, um, are uh, are not African American on, in a city that's overwhelmingly African American. We are the blackest major city in the city of Detroit. And so there's a whole host of reasons about why that occurred uh, that were in part based on redistricting and also based on um, challenges that we have about coalescing around um, a, um, a concessionary uh, candidate. But what all that talks about is that there are some major shifts that are occurring in the culture of the community and the status of the community of Detroit. And it seems as if we're making steps backwards as opposed to uh, as an opportunity when we should be advancing and finding new ways for the, the improvement of the circumstances and conditions of the majority of the residents of the city, we seem to be taking steps back, back in a way that looks similar to what they looked like in the late 60s. Mm. And so that makes you start to question, where is this trend going? So you talk about gentrification, we know that a number of the community, number of portions of the community in fact, some of some areas that are getting a lot of attention um, are being gentrified to in, ex, attract people in from the suburbs or their children in from the suburbs in a, in a way of uh, what they would call um, improving the status of Detroit. And I don't necessarily think that that's actually the way to do it. Mm. Marcellus, we know that there are... <laughs> entertainment districts, different areas of Memphis. I've been to them all, <laughs> being right up the street. Um, but maybe speaking to not, not only your own project, but what you've been able to observe uh, or your thoughts about gentrification of areas affecting generational wealth in our communities of color. Yeah, that's a, a really... <clears throat> 
you know, great question. And I'm not sure, I mean, Gary kind of went in and, and um, a lot of those, you know, a lot of those themes you see play out and, and black cities all across um, the US. Um, maybe I'll talk about it from the vantage point of our project. And instead of maybe talking about gentrification, what I would like to touch on is black investment, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and the importance of black investment and in indigenous local communities. So when we were looking for a space, now mind you, we were raising $11 million. We were ready to invest nine to $10 million in a brand new, brand new facility. So there were a lot of people in my ear, a lot of, you know, black people, a lot of affluent people who um, encouraged me to not put our building where we ended up putting our building, who wanted me to put our building, not to be limited, to put our building in a space that maybe was more affluent, that would have um, more amenities for our customer base, mm. that would potentially make our customer base feel safer in terms of when they bring their kids and drop them off, um, and so forth and so forth. And so, <clears throat> When we were deciding where we should invest, when we would, were deciding where this space should be, it was very important to me that we walk the talk. One, it was very important to me that we invest in the communities that we want to serve and that the kids in these communities could look to this, this, this structure, this building in their backyard and have a sense of pride because it existed there. And so um, what I will say, you know, is that I think it's important that as Black artists and creatives who are in positions to um, build spaces that we are making choices about where those spaces are that help the communities that we are talking about. Um, and so we're excited to be part of community-centric revitalization and to hopefully um, try to combat some of, some of the unfortunate things that happen when economic development is fueled by gentrification, if that makes sense. And so um, that's what I'll add. Thank you, Marcella. So Gary, you gave us the perspective of a lot of the political changes. So it's like, it's looking like a time from whence we came that we're not trying to return to. We want no. to forward. And then Marcellus, your point is we should be thinking about or, or even assessing our black investment into communities and where we want to be and 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 walking and talking in in the same timber when we're in these communities that we're serving so those are both very valid perspectives um good points it makes me think about my late grandmother my dad's mom who was an indigenous woman she had a laundromat and she ran a boarding house before airbnb there was Tarvel Linda Shears Mercer, and she made sure that there was a space for young college kids in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, which is about 45 minutes south from Little Rock. Uh, they have a place to live. Their laundry was clean. She also made custom garments for people and was in business for a very long time to support herself and my dad and my uncle when they were growing up. So thinking about how valuable she was as a woman of color in her community in the South in the 20s, 30s, and 40s running this business and being an example for others who wanted to follow suit. But sometimes, as Gary mentioned, those political changes get in the way. So I guess what I want to ask next is what are some resources? So we're thinking about Black investment, we're thinking about the political landscape, uh, our own businesses and our artistic art forms as Black storytellers. What are some resources for our communities of color or those who are indigenous to the local area uh, that they need to be successful 
when thinking about doing this placemaking work? And Gary, let's start with you. I think the most important critical resource is the faith and the engagement of Black people. I think what Marcella said about investment is accurate, but it's more than just money. I think sometimes we have a tendency to fear our own success. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Um, that if we were to, if if we were to get exactly what we want in the way we wanted, we fear the power that that would provide for us, the level of attention and scrutiny, and in some cases, the um, onslaught that we might engender because of it. And I think that we don't, I think in many cases, historically, we've seen how that has impeded development, progress, growth, because it doesn't take the most brave person. It just takes the most committed. You understand what I'm saying? If we lead or li live by what we value, and we focus our efforts that way, your path is clear. We don't have to question what our moves are. Or as Marcellus was saying about people encouraging him to look elsewhere because they didn't feel comfortable or they were they questioned the safety of that community. The, I live, you know, in Detroit, people have questioned the safety of living in this community as long as I've been here. They have questioned the viability of trying to do anything here. And yet people have done things. Mm -hmm. They've created things. They've created things in spite sometimes of the circumstances that they deal with. So I don't think it's really about um, always about the level of investment. It's about the will. I, and that's something that you have to generate by example and by encouraging others to feel, see what you see in, a, in whatever vision you're trying to paint for, for them. Because I think part of the, the circumstances that we deal with is an unwillingness to stretch ourselves mm -hmm. in many cases. At least that's my perspective on the subject. Thank you for those thoughts, Gary. Uh, yes, faith, valuable resource. And, and to stretching ourselves because it is scary. Speaking from my perspective, I do have that fear sometimes as a woman, as a Black woman, as a Black woman creative in a lot of the circles that have been pinched around me <laughs> and nodded off how to move forward and just being committed uh, being consistent and and living the way that you value the things around you. I appreciate that perspective. Marcellus, I'll kick it to you as what resources do you think we need in our communities uh, for this work? Yeah, I loved, thank you. I loved um, Gary's response. I think, you know, in addition to fear, I think that um, Black creatives have had to live. Um, we've lived so long by making a dollar out of 15 cents that we are almost socialized to, to function from a scarcity mindset. So in addition to fear, we're also not honest. Mm -hmm. And it's not deliberate, um, but we are not we really aren't always honest about what we need <clears throat> because we've not had the luxury to, to be honest. And so one of the first things I think in terms of resources that creatives who are thinking about placemaking need is to be honest, to be honest about what you need, 
to find the people in the community, to find the folks that are going to help you um, unlearn some of that socialization to get to a place where you have the courage, as, as Gary talked about with the fear, that you have the courage to be honest. Um, you know, some more tangible things, I think a great project manager, if you're thinking about building a space, you need a good project manager. Um, you need a board that um, is courageous um, and that has vision, you know, and that's not scared and that's not operating from fear. Um, I've seen a lot of black creatives and a lot of black organizations that have boards that don't believe that what their the leaders are trying to do can happen. That's a recipe for, it's just not a recipe for success. You need a board that has a bigger vision than the leader. Mm -hmm. And that's very hard to find, but that's what you need to get to. Um, you need a board that can see things that, that, you, that you're scared of um, because you need that type of support as you navigate these, this type of terrain. Um, yeah, so um, again, honesty, philosophical, and you know, tangible things, immediate, good project manager, and a, a board that, that is bold and courageous. I say, uh, MPN audience, the doors of the Church of Gary and Marcellus are now open. <laughs> Passing the collection plate around so you can give them all their coins and their flowers now. Uh, both very beautiful responses. And as we we're, we're getting close to the end of our, our time together, we don't want to leave you NPN audience, but we, we are going to wrap it up here in a moment. I have one more question and maybe we can fuse these questions uh, into our final thoughts as well as we move this place making work forward. Uh, and you you spoke a little bit to it, Marcellus, in terms of like, get a good project manager, get the board. But I, I'm, I'm curious if you can speak to how organizations can work with developers to approach the preservation of communities without contributing to the erasure of the history of that area. And I want to start with you, Marcellus, and then definitely get your perspective uh, from Detroit on the Black Bottoms and other areas of importance. But if you could speak to a little bit of how we can work with developers to maintain uh, the, the the cultural uh, autonomy of, of a place that we're right. in. Right. And, um, and I'll make it a little broader than developers, just because I don't have a lot of direct experience of working with developers, but I know exactly what you're asking. And um, I think whether it's a developer, whether it's an architect, whether it's a contractor, whether it's um, a funder, you know, there's a lot of education that needs to happen, particularly when those entities are not people of color and who aren't, who don't, who don't, have the understanding of the communities that you serve um, and who aren't part of those communities. You know, we worked with, um, I can talk a lot about our experience with our architect. You know, we worked with um, a local architect on the design of our space. And um, we wanted the building to feel warm. We wanted the design to feel classic. You know, ballet's over 400 years old. Um, but we also wanted it to be reflective of the rich legacy and history of Black ballet pioneers that have come before. And just because it was classic, we didn't want it to feel elitist, European, or out of touch. Um, instead, we wanted it to feel regal and majestic. We wanted the idea of classic to transcend one culture. Um, and we wanted the design to highlight the contrast between classic and contemporary, which is at the heart of our brand. So I say all that to say that there were lots of conversations, lots of discussion, lots of education around our values, around the communities that we serve. And oftentimes we were in rooms with professionals 
who thought that their professional experience trumped our understanding of the communities we served. Mm -hmm. Difficult conversations had to be had, you know, often around, you may be a professional, you, you may know what you know, but I know about the communities I serve best. Um, because the more we reflect, whether it's in the design, um, through architecture, or through the conceptualization of projects with developers, the more we reflect the brilliance of the cultures of marginalized communities, the easier it will be to have them walk through the doors. Mm. I say, yes, I know what I know and you know what you know. So let's bring what we know together, but don't erase what I know. You know what I'm talking about. And I know my people. Gary, I know you know your people in Detroit. No, continue Marcellus. No, 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 I was just saying that um, it was a learning curve for me to to stand firm in, in my voice and and what I knew particularly when I'm in spaces with people who think that their professional experience trumps that. And so it's hard. I'm not, I'm not going to overstate um, that it's something hard to do and it can be overwhelming, particularly if, if you, you know, it's your first project like it was for us. Um, but, but it's important. And um, that's the only way to your point that, that the erasure doesn't happen. Mm. Gary, I want to give you some space to think about this as some of that erasure has already happened, but the work that Plowshares is doing to mitigate that and some of your thoughts on how we can work together as we reimagine our communities. You know, it's interesting. Um, listening to um, Marcellus talked about the experiences of working with professionals who bring their expertise to your project, but don't have the benefit of your lived experiences that are going to impact what you are, what you are creating for an audience that they may not be a part of, of which they may not be a part of. Um, in many cases, it's as if we have to apologize for having some kind of difference from their point of view. I profess ignorance as I've gotten older. I'm very comfortable with expressing my ignorance in certain topics because I think that's a very freeing thing. So I can tell you right now, I know nothing about architectural design or about structural integrity that's not my daily work. But I do know Black people. Hmm. And from my life, I understand the challenges what that, of what that statement brings, right? So when I create art, my art is designed to speak to that. So naturally, if I'm creating a home for the artist and that art, it also needs to speak to that. So it requires us, again, to be firm in the knowledge of who we are, Mm -hmm. and who we serve, um, not out of a sense of superiority, but just out of the simple fact that this is of importance. So if there has to be changes or a different point of view taken to a perspective, you know, in structural design or in fiscal, you know, fiscal responsibility or whatever case we want whatever area you want to look at it. We have to do that because this space is designed to serve a community 
which you may not be a part of, but it needs to meet their needs and not yours because of something you learned in a school or in a book you read or through your technical experience in your career. I need you to bring that knowledge here to help me accomplish the things I need to accomplish for these people. Mm -hmm. Because I can't, I can't create, I can't create a space that isn't welcoming to the very audience I'm seeking to serve. I can't place it in a portion of the city that is not going to be welcoming to that community or where that community will be profiled and questioned. And I can't do it building this, building an institution now that's supposed to sit for the for generations if I'm not comfortable with how we are designing the space to meet the needs of the very people we're asking to walk through the doors. So for me, that's the way we have to look at it. Not just the audience, but the artists who are bringing a whole host of things along with them. This is supposed to be a, if we're creating, if, we're, if the mission of the organization is designed to serve these artists, these, these patrons, then it is designed to serve them in every capacity. There's technical experience and there's lived experience. And hey. we have lived <laughs> in this skin in our communities and we know what our people need. We know what they deserve. We know what they desire. Yes, and we live in a world that is not designed for us. This is, it's waking up every morning as a black man is not the optimum structure for this, this country. And so if you are going to, and, but it's not an excuse for giving up. Right. So if you're going to succeed, you have to understand the challenges and you have to redouble an understanding of who and what you are so that you can meet those challenges and overcome them. Um, and if you're and again, if you're serving that community, then you need to take their concerns into consideration primarily. And everything else has to be modified to make sure that that they are comfortable in this environment and the story being told in this environment is one that supports and sustains it, not comments or contradicts it. Ashe, what a beautiful way to put a bow on our time together. Uh, today again, thank you, Gary and Marcellus for giving your thoughts, your energy, your time, your emotion, your lived experience <laughs> on this topic. And I also want to thank the NPN conference goers, our audience today for tuning in. Hopefully we got to all of your questions and thoughts in the chat and that you have a fantastic conference experience for the rest of your time. So thank you for listening. And we'll be sure to pass our information on to the organizers if you wanna reach out to myself, Gary or Marcellus, if you have additional questions. All right, y'all, peace. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.